Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted more happiness and resilience in your life, or greater positivity in the face of storms, then do we have the Buddha's Brain Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Rick Hansen, neuropsychologist, brain expert, and the best-selling author of Hardwiring Happiness, Just One Thing, and The Buddha's Brain. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how to develop resilience and a Buddha's brain, one simple practice at a time. That plus we'll talk about bionic eyes, the importance of meditation, the power of rock climbing, and what in the world dodging sticks and chasing carrots has to do with anything. So welcome back to the show, Rick. Are you ready to shine? All right, Michael. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, so uh, happy. Considering to... some of what you're dealing with, we got to talk <laughs> about before we started here. Yes, and, and we're going to dive into that in just a minute, all about truly hurricanes and the Buddha brain today. But before we do that, would you mind, you've been on the show before, but would you mind giving us a Dr. Rick Hansen 101? A super short version, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, parent of two, husband of one, uh, and I live in California, and uh, let's see, I'm really interested in the intersection of clinical psychology, mm -hmm. neuroscience, and mm -hmm. contemplative practice, contemplative wisdom. And I think if you imagine those as three circles, the intersection of the three is the sweet spot for lots and lots of cool ideas. But even more of interest to me, given my pragmatic orientation, lots and lots of very effective methods grounded in science, informed by clinical practice, and shaped by the wisdom of the world's great traditions. So that's where I work professionally. That's where I try to be useful to people. That's the 101. On the side, I've had a lot of fun rock climbing, wilderness, reading, politics, you know, enjoying life. Uh, I, I have a good time. Awesome. So if we if we go back in time, was it your contemplative practice that came first or, or where did this interest come from? Okay. Uh, the slightly extended version, which I think is a useful uh, point to start with, is to go back for people listening or watching right now to think about sort of what you knew when you were really young, mm -hmm. but maybe couldn't put into words. And I've been reflecting a lot lately about what I knew when I was really young and couldn't put into words. And it was that there was so much unnecessary unhappiness around me. And I grew up in a relatively stable situation, but mm -hmm. still lots of unnecessary bickering, conflict, the grown ups, the kids, you know, my family, the neighborhood at school. And I'm like, what? What's this about? Why? So it really set me on my path. Um, I kind of went to college at the tail end of the 60s, the early 70s. I caught the wave of the human potential movement. Also, a uh, wave of psychology dropped me into uh, contemplative practice in the Eastern traditions, uh, although somewhat informed by the Western religious and spiritual traditions. That kind of really got me going. I bounced around a bit, and then by the time I was pushing, uh, in, by the time I was 30, I was in grad school headed for a clinical PhD, uh, which focused in part on the developmental needs of young children. So I think also a lot about how the mind-brain system is shaped in early childhood mm -hmm. with lingering effects that last a lifetime. Uh, that then also was a period, uh, as I got my PhD, that I began getting extremely interested in neuroscience. And neuroscience is really coming of age. It's a baby science, but in the last 10 years, it's exploded with tons of new findings that have lots and lots of practical implications, in addition to just being really cool to think about. So the three together, clinical practice, contemplative wisdom, neuroscience, led me to Buddha's brain, which I wrote and started writing really almost 10 years ago, uh, published a little later, and then whoosh, I've caught a wave ever since. So that's, that's the bottom line for me. And the... The takeaway for me is at a time when, to use your hurricane metaphor, that's a, more than metaphor uh, for many people right now, when the waves of life come, especially in a larger context in which people increasingly feel like the institutions, the communities, mm -hmm. the, the morality, the frameworks that used to be dependable are kind of falling apart, uh, while it's important to do what we can to help the world around us, the essence of self-reliance is to grow the good inside ourselves each day so that we have more and more with us when the waves of life come and we've got to deal with them for better or worse. And so for me, this is the essence of self-reliance we're talking about. 
is kind of old school, although it's you know got some nice fancy neuroscientific and you know meditative uh, aspects to it. Um, so it's really on us, and it's great. Here's the point: it's great to know that we have the power, based on positive neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. to change our brains for the better, and therefore our minds for the better, and our lives for the better as well. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that we always have that capacity, no matter what's happening in the world around us. Thank you. So let, let's go there. There's so many questions I can go just out of that one piece. And, and we're going to yeah. double back around to hurricanes. For, for those that are listening, we're just about, my wife Jessica and myself, we're just about to evacuate from where we're at. So it's, it's a very, I don't want to use the term exciting because I'm not saying, oh, let's bring this on far from it. But it's a very stimulating time. But, but first off, let's talk about what in the world is a self-transforming brain. Okay. Uh, well, if you think about it, we're transforming the brain continuously. For example, uh, we are, you and I right now, and listeners or viewers, can remember what we've been talking about the last 10 minutes or so. Or uh, as young children, we learn to walk instead of crawl. So that's, you know, there's an ongoing lifetime process of learning, growth, and development. The learning I'm most interested in is the learning that usually matters the most, emotional intelligence, social intelligence intra internal mm -hmm. intelligence and capability with yourself uh, uh, being able to motivate yourself to do the things that are good for you that you don't naturally incline toward doing like for me getting on a treadmill and grinding uphill for half an hour in the morning for example so uh, that's a natural process it's not exotic it's not mysterious the idea of the brain changing itself gets to the crux of the matter since we are continuously being changed by our experiences, especially as we may get to negative ones mm -hmm. because of the brain's negativity bias, because we're being continuously changed by our, our experiences, why not take charge of the change process ourselves from the inside out? In other words, if you know a little bit that's useful about how your brain actually works, you can protect it from painful, negative, harmful, burdensome experiences. And if you know how your brain works a little bit, that's, that's what I focus on, you can then change your brain for the better by looking for and then really internalizing authentic, beneficial experiences, gradually hardwiring resilient well-being and love and wisdom into your own nervous system every single day. That's the essence of the process. The mechanics of it are complex and fascinating. There's a famous saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. So we have the formation of new connections between neurons. We have the sensitization uh, and uh, existing connections. We have increased blood flows to parts of the brain that do different things. It's like working a muscle. You work that muscle, you get more blood coming to it. It literally gets thicker in terms of the cortex. We have changes in gene expression deep in the bowels of the nuclei of individual cells, you know, in terms of unwrapping or wrapping uh, the DNA molecules um, inside those uh, nuclei. We also have uh, increased activation of different regions of the brain, shifts of uh, brain waves over time. There are many ways in which the change process happens, the learning, growth, development, healing, transformation, awakening process happens. There are many ways in which the mechanics of that unfold. But the bottom line is that, A, we are very vulnerable to the impact of negative experiences. Mm -hmm. B, there's a lot we can do to rest our attention on what we want to grow inside ourselves and then take it in. So then we take it with us wherever we go. Thank you. So we'll dive into a few of these pieces. There's, there's so much exciting here. Growing the good, negativity, bias, vulnerable to negative experiences. Let's start there because we have, for a lot of people, either they've been involved in a negative weather experience, they have a storm coming their way, or something else difficult has affected them in our lives. What do you mean vulnerable to negative experiences and, and how does that affect the brain? Right. Uh, it's useful so far, Michael, for us to create an overall frame. And going forward, I'll answer more succinctly. Uh, so it's the idea that uh, the negativity bias is the term scientists use. My shorthand term is we have a brain that's like Velcro for bad, but Teflon for good. Why? It's because as uh, biological evolution occurred 
uh, the nervous system evolved over 600 million years. And we have baked into us today in the reptilian brainstem, mammalian subcortex, and primate human uh, neocortex. We have baked into us today the solutions to survival, life and death survival problems faced by our ancient ancestors. Mm -hmm. For them, negative experiences, the quote unquote sticks of life, like saber toothed tigers and other predators, those sticks usually had more urgency and impact in terms of raw survival and living to see the sunrise than quote unquote carrots like food or mating opportunities. If you don't get a carrot today in the wild, you'll have a chance of one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid that predator today, whoop, no more carrots forever. So therefore, we have this tendency to scan for bad news. There are really five aspects to the negativity bias. Mm -hmm. We scan for bad news, one. Two, we overfocus upon it when we find it. Yeah. Three, we overreact to it. There's a lot of research behind all these points. Four, the experience is fast-tracked into emotional memory systems and somatic memory systems. Once burned, twice shy, never forget. And five, the stress hormone cortisol that's released when we're irritated or frazzled or exasperated or multitasking or wrangling with someone. The stress hormone cortisol uh, sensitizes the brain, especially a part of it called the amygdala, the alarm bell of the brain, mm -hmm. sensitizes the alarm bell. So now it reacts ever more readily. Rah, rah, rah. And also cortisol weakens and actually kills neurons in a different part of the brain called the hippocampus that puts things in context, calms down the amygdala, and tells another part of the brain, the hypothalamus, to quit calling for stress hormones. Wow, this I want to, I want to a pause you there. Cycle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm catching. So what you're what you're saying is that if you get really stressed out, really concerned about things, or you go on down to a negative path, you generate cortisol. You you kill off part of the buffering or balancing mechanism of the brain. So now you're going to even go farther in that direction with the same stimulus later on. You totally got it. It's a vicious cycle. A very important point, um, I'm not saying that we should suppress negative experiences or deny the negative or uh, I don't believe in positive thinking. I believe in realistic thinking. But there's a world of difference between being hijacked by a negative experience. You know, mm -hmm. you're resentful or you feel inadequate or you're really angry at someone or you're just ruminating about your worries about something. That is not good for you that will reinforce that negative pathway really, really rapidly. But to be able to step back from the negative experience, the worry, the physical pain, the hurt, the sadness, the material surface from your childhood, being able to step back from it, like you're watching it as a movie from 20 rows back uh, with a lot of compassion for what's happening on the screen, that changes everything. If you do that, you interrupt the reinforcing process. And in fact, uh, if you can hold your experiences in this way, in the frame of mindful awareness, then you actually start to associate the stability and peacefulness of the observer or observing position or process to the negative material, which actually gradually can calm it down. So I'm not saying anything um, about denying the negative, and it's really useful after you've observed it for some authentic, useful period of time. It could be 10 seconds, it could be 10 days, it could be 10 months. But after you've observed it, shift into releasing it and then replacing it with something wholesome and beneficial. Which means that we need to become more aware, more mindful, more present, so that we're not letting the negative experiences or that bias take control of us. 100%. Uh, it's a Kind of a gross metaphor. I, I grew up with dogs. You know, I cleaned up after them many times. And if you think of the metaphor of the mind as like an ancient temple with a beautiful floor, and most temples in the East have, uh, probably the West as well, have temple dogs. Dogs wander in. So imagine a dog wanders into this beautiful floor and makes a mess in the middle of the floor. All right, that's your mind. All right, so somebody came in, they left a mess on the floor of your mind. Now, what do you do? If you get angry at the dog, beat the dog, hurt the dog, that's not very good for you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you just let the mess sit there, it's going to stain the floor. And the floor of the mind, the floor of the brain is very spongy and receptive to doo-doo. Don't <laughs> let the doo-doo sit there. And clean it up. And then 
focus on other things, you know, that are really beautiful and wholesome. So one of the, my takeaways from a deep immersion in the neuroscience of all this has been to be much more, I guess, of a caretaker, much more of a, of a kind parent in a way uh, with my own negative material and to not indulge it. Lots of people either fuel their negative loops or they're mm -hmm. passive about them. They feel just they can't do anything. They just put up with them. And the art to me is to be aware of when you're going negative, step back from it and hold it in mindful awareness, extract whatever the value is. Maybe there's a lesson here. Maybe there really is something like a hurricane bearing down on you that you got to really deal with or a hurricane emerging inside your own consciousness. You have to deal with. All right. But as soon as you can move on to the second and third phases of the process of releasing and replacing. These are the three fundamental ways to relate to your mind usefully. Be with it, mm -hmm. reduce the negative, grow the positive. They all work together. I tend to focus on growing the positive because it's the least focused on, and it's in many ways the most immediately beneficial for people. But it's in this larger context. A lot of people get stuck at just witnessing the mind, or they jump too quickly to fixing it. You've got to balance it. You have to be with it long enough for the fixing to have any kind of traction, but after you've been, been with it for a while and learned all you can from it, move on to releasing and replacing. Thank you so much. So let's say that now, now that we got a little, little background here, you start to see the negative. Yeah. How do you then either begin to reduce that or start to grow the positive? Well, that's great. Let's, real example here. So let's say someone is worried about a, a, an objective condition like a hurricane or a job loss or an illness or an issue with a child, something real, okay? Or it could be something stirred up. So I'll, I'll use something real. Like there's an objective condition. Uh, right now, I've got some weird health problems. I have a funny little thing in my shoulder. It's not mortal, but it's weird. So I'd be with it, explore the sensations. I reflect on, you know, it is an experience. I'm aware of my worry. I'm aware of it stirred up. I'm aware of concerns. I feel it. I look around my mind. Is there anything new to learn here? <laughs> is there anything more to learn about the doo-doo? I mean, I've inspected it. I've smelled <laughs> it. I see where it is. You know, I know what it is. It's there. It's not bad. It's not evil. And it's doo-doo. It's there. It's not pleasant. It's not helpful. All right. So then I shift into uh, reducing the negative. So I might release tension from my body. I might take some exhalations and relax. Mm -hmm. Or I might let some feelings flow. I might just yell in the shower to get it off my chest or write a letter I'll never send or just gripe about something to my wife just to get it off my chest and move on. Or maybe I've got some thoughts that I recognize are making me upset here that are just not true, like worries or beliefs that are just not valid. I go, no, I can let that go. I can let that go. My sweet dad um, lived to be almost 97. He grew up on a ranch in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Then he became a zoologist and a science, scientist. He had a very sweet gesture. I'm going to try to show it in the screen here. He would just, his hand would go like that. And he would say things like, you don't need to fuss with that, Rick. You don't need to fuss with that. There's a kind of release. You're letting go. You imagine that. also we can relax taking things personally. You know, the ego eye is like this contracted fist. We can open the hand. Just let it go. Let it go. So those are aspects of the releasing phase. Many, many methods in um, self-help, pop psychology, clinical psychology, and the spiritual traditions have to do with releasing, including abandoning unwholesome desires. Etc. Then there's the growing the good phase, and there are the fundamentals of that I'm an expert on, truly, I don't use that word lightly. Um, the essence of it is two steps, really simple. You can do them 10 times a day. Experience what you want to grow, mm -hmm. take it into yourself. Both are necessary. Many people focus on beneficial experiences, but they're wasted on the brain. They leave all that money on the table. There's no lasting value. If we don't turn a passing state into a lasting trait. There's no lasting value by definition. It was a momentarily pleasant experience. It was cool, but we didn't grow from it. We weren't changed. A lot of people do things. They'll go on a weekend retreat. They'll listen to a, me. They'll listen to you. Uh, they'll read a book. They'll go to church. They'll go, you know, go on, they'll go to the therapist. And it's useful in the moment, 
But three, four hours later, definitely three, four days later, they're baseline. They're back to baseline. There's been no actual change. So if you're interested in actual change, you have to change your brain. You want to change your mind for real? You got to change your brain for real. And the how of that is actually really simple. The longer we stay with an experience, the more it's going to get consolidated into lasting changes of neural structure or function. So a breath or two or three or more. The more fully we feel it in the body, the more those neurons are going to be firing together and therefore wiring together. The more we recognize why an experience is personally important, relevant, meaningful, we remember what's important to us, the more it's going to go in. The more that we, rec that we track or, and focus on the rewards in the experience, the ways that it's enjoyable, uh, pleasurable, interesting, delightful, that's going to release two neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine in your brain that will flag that pattern of activation neurologically that underpins the experience. So now that pattern of activation is flagged in the hippocampus technically as a keeper if it's associated with reward and therefore dopamine and norepinephrine. So that experience of gratitude or grit, or that, oh, this is how to act with my partner to head off an argument that I don't really need to have, or this is how to parent my teenager better, or this is how to supervise my employees in a better way. If we can see what's uh, rewarding about that experience, that's going to release dopamine and flag it as a keeper. A person doesn't need to do all these things at any single time they're learning something, mm -hmm. but the more you do, the better. The point is, we can help ourselves receive into ourselves the benefits that are available to us in the experiences we're already having. And along the way, sometimes, yeah, generate experiences like pulling up compassion or pulling up fortitude or pulling up determination to deal with something. Sure, pull it up. But once the song is playing in your mind, the brain doesn't care what the source was. And once the song is playing in the inner iPod, turn on the recorder. Well, that's huge. The fact that it doesn't know, it doesn't matter where it came from, yeah. implies you have the ability without stuffing it to switch the record and then to be able to make the groove so you're playing it easier and easier and easier. Yeah, absolutely right, Michael. It's a really great way of catching things super quickly and putting them well. Thank you. So I want to get at when when you said experience what you want to grow, I realize yeah. that comes on two different tracks. Sure, there's the law of attraction. Hey, I want to be rich. I want to be abundant. I want to yada, yada, yada. Yeah, but none really of that's comes... an experience, by the way. Say that again? None of that is an experience. All of that is a means to an end. So we say I want to be rich because I'd like to experience more happiness or fill in the blank. But that's yeah, where I'm going. And... Yep. I'm going uh, at what, going. what I call what I call when I coach with somebody and I want them to do visualization work, I say I want to go to the essence. And the essence is the feeling behind that what uh, I'm using the word experience, but you're saying not experience, but, but we're on, this, on the same page. Yeah. What you're saying is if we can get at the essence and we practice getting to that essence on a moment to moment basis, that changes everything because we're now wired differently. Yes, and the reason I'm pausing, I, if you'll bear with me, I want to make a couple quick points here. So first off, in medicine and psychology, there's this fundamental idea that the path your life takes over a day, a year, or a lifetime boils down to just three causes. It's the result of three causes. What are those three causes? How you manage your challenges, how you protect your vulnerabilities, and how you grow and use resources of various kinds. Those three causes are located in three places, out in the world, in the body, and in the mind. This is a fundamental organizing framework, which gives you nine places, nine ways to make your life better. You can intervene in any one of those ways, in any one of those places. Of those nine opportunities, mm -hmm. the one that generally has the greatest opportunity is resources, growing and using resources in your mind. I'm not against any of the other eight cells in the three by three matrix there, grid, but we have the most influence over our own mind, much more than we have over our body and world. Second, resources 
can be immediately developed. It's hard to change challenges and vulnerabilities. Often we're kind of stuck with them. Also, you take mental resources with you wherever you go. They're not dependent upon external conditions and circumstances. They're not dependent upon your body's functioning, the side of dementia. And also, uh, you can apply them to just about any situation. So we're we're focusing here now on growing mental resources to help your life be better. That right there. Second, how do you grow them? And two, two, two things. So let's suppose a person says, I want to be rich because mm-hmm. I want to feel successful. Or I want to be rich because I want to be able to enjoy certain kinds of things, like being living in a nicer home. Or, or I want to be rich because I want to feel the fulfillment and meaningfulness of being able to put my kids through college. could be any one of a number of reasons. So as the result of the, the being rich, which is a means to an end, the end at some deep level boils down to what it feels like to be you. Mm-hmm. Right? If you're interested in feeling successful or happy or that you're loved and loving, uh, the most direct path to that is to have multiple experiences of feeling successful, happy, loved, and loving, and take them into you, to yourself. Then, whether or not you're rich, you're still happy. You still feel successful. You still feel loved and loving. It's not either or. It's just what's more reliable. It's not easy to get rich. It's easy, basically, to feel grateful, happy, loved, and loving. We have that. It's You have to do the work, Mm -hmm. but it's very straightforward. Experience feeling grateful, happy, loved, and loving, and then internalize those experiences. Or more generally, you think to finish, what do I, what do I, what does it take to get rich? What do I need to grow inside my mind? Including, let's say, the wisdom from someone like Michael Sandler, who says, well, you need to change your attitudes in these ways. You need to organize your time in these ways. You need to recognize opportunities over here. You need to recognize threats over there. But also you need to be not so worried about risks over there. They're not so big for you. You need to grow and learn in various ways. So how do you grow and learn mental Mm -hmm. resources, resources in the mind that you draw upon to get rich? And then the way into that, the way to grow them is very, very straightforward. Experience what you want to grow. We don't have a brain like Neo in the Matrix where they just jacked in a cable and he suddenly knew how to fly a helicopter. You have to experience what you want to grow. But once you're experiencing it, once you're experiencing, let's say, the conviction that what Michael's telling you is true, or once you're experiencing a felt sense of confidence, like, yeah, I can take chances. I can swing out. Or if you're feeling an internal sense of commitment, I just got to get up an hour earlier every morning and spend an hour a day on my book. And an hour a day is not that much, but adding up over a year, I'll have a book at the end of it all, which is, by the way, pretty much true. Uh, So, um, you know, if you so you experience those things that are the first step in growing those mental muscles inside that will then make you rich or help you be rich or give you the best off strategy getting rich. And then once you're having that experience, once the song is playing, do the things I've said, stay with the experience for a breath or two or three, Mm -hmm. feel it in your body, track what's important about it, feel what's rewarding. That's going to turbocharge your brain's learning process in that experience and maximize your gain from the experiences you're having. Thank you. From there, what is one simple way we can begin on a day-to-day basis to grow our mental resources? Wow. Uh, one, don't waste the beneficial experiences you're already having. Almost everyone, unless they're severely clinically depressed, literally, or in agonizing pain or deep in some prison somewhere. Uh, Most everyone is having many, many beneficial experiences every day. Mm -hmm. Little experiences of self-worth, little moments of capability, little uh, a sense of satisfaction in completing a task, Mm -hmm. a sense of gratitude, a sense of um, uh, relaxation or reassurance or relief. So you're already having many, many experiences that would build up over time resilient well-being. Don't waste those experiences. Appreciate them 
you know, recognize them. That's the first thing I would say. A lot of people just go through life. They don't notice all the jewels. I call them ordinary jewels, hundreds of little jewels on their path through the day. They just step right over them. They don't notice them. Or if they notice them, they don't feel anything. And if they feel anything, they kind of shrug and move on. They don't stay with the experience. So that's the first thing. Second, when you hit high value experiences half a dozen or a dozen times a day, that little moment where you realize something, wow, that's important to remember. Or a little moment where you know that for you, you need to grow more sense of uh, confidence, or you need to grow more a sense of patience, or maybe you need to, you want to build up a, an internal sense of fulfillment in life as it is, or a sense of inner peace, or anything. In my case, growing up kind of shy and dorky, very young, going through school, parents without much empathy, feeling like you have value and people want you, they include you. Whatever it is, whatever you know is your high value experience, I mean, what's on the short list, your top three acts, when you're having an experience of that, bring the recorder, bring the vacuum cleaner, stay with it for half a minute. If you want, stay with it for three minutes, but stay with it. And if you, if you do these two things, I'm saying, one is you move through your day, taking the good along the way. Slow it down for a breath. Give your brain a chance to catch up to your experiences. One. Two, if a few times a day you look for that high value strength you're trying to grow inside yourself, that inner resource, and you really focus on it for half a minute, really registering it and staying with it. If you do those two things, which take less than five minutes a day, you will totally change your day. And over a few days, certainly over a few weeks, you will feel major lasting changes inside yourself. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm realizing I'm like a, a kid in a candy store because you hit something a minute ago. And, and I, I'm thinking back to one of the most poignant moments of my whole life. And it's very recently. And I was thinking of you. And I was thinking of something that you taught me from the last time you were on the show. My wife, Jessica, and I, we went down to South Carolina on this beautiful lake, kicked back on kayaks, uh, heads up toward the sky. It's raining out. The uh, clouds start to part at the last second. There's 99% of the solar eclipse totality, light shooting out from a black sun, total darkness around us. And toward the end of it, I go, anchor it. Take it all in and anchor the experience, which is you. You taught us that you really want to take a photograph of the moment, embed that into ourselves so that we have the resource to come back to that whenever we need to. Yeah, that's right. And I did not invent this. Like the term anchoring I got from neuro-linguistic programming, mm -hmm. uh, you know, great teachers, great therapists, great parents, great kindergarten teachers use these methods because we all have the same brain. Basically, we all have a human brain. Human brain changes in two steps. And in the second critical step of installation, where you wire it into yourself, the hardwiring step, you know, uh, the ways to do that are universal. And I've listed them. Um, we all kind of know them, but we don't do them. We don't. Do now, what you did in that experience is fantastic. That was like a Hall of Fame <laughs> installation of this extraordinary experience you were having. Um, and like for me, so I've been married a long time. There'll be a little moments <clears throat> with my wife where I'll realize, oh, it goes better when I do this mm -hmm. rather than that. I want to re recognize that. There's a term in psychology, a one trial learner. It's the rat that the first time it goes down the, this tunnel with cheese, it now remembers where the cheese is. That's a smart rat. Or it learns that down this tunnel is this really aggravating puff of air in its face. Then they go, I don't want up that tunnel. I want to be a one trial learner. Right? The, the name of the game in life can't do anything about the past. But what you can do each day is grow and learn as much as possible. You can steep it your growth curve as you go through life. And that angle right there, what's your average growth rate per day in your life? It's like, what's your average rate of return on your investments mm -hmm. or the interest rate on your savings? That angle shapes everything over the course of your life. A lot of people are pretty flat or actually they decline over life. Some people have a nice steady linear growth curve. The superstars of personal growth 
the people who really engage the superpower of superpowers, which is learning, have a curvilinear growth curve. They accelerate. They learn how to learn along the way. And that's the opportunity, honestly, for all of us. And we can use that opportunity in the intimacy and immediacy of our daily experiences many times a day. How do we increase that angle? Uh, well, first, um, increase the conversion rate of your experiences to lasting change as you go through your day and using the methods I've described. Uh, I go into a lot of detail in my writings on my website. You'll link to it, I'm sure. It's tons of freely offered stuff. There, the, there are a lot of details and there are a lot of applications, but the essence is incredibly simple. Have it, enjoy it. Start with the experience, and it needs to be felt. The more, the you know, it's, it's important to let it be a real experience, not just a passing idea or perception. Have the experience, get the song playing, and then enjoy it. Five seconds, ten seconds, a breath, two, reflecting on it, staying with it. That's going to change your brain immediately. And last, learn how to learn. So if you want, you want linear. Angle improvement, you know, increase the conversion rate of the experiences you're having to lasting change. And I've described how to do that. And then along the way, learn how to learn. Learn like you're teaching. Learn about transformation. Learn about personal growth. Learn about healing. Learn about learning. Uh, there's a certain amount of material that's learn to learn or learn about learning applied to academic settings. Mm -hmm. There's almost, it's bizarre. I've been in the human potential psychology line of work for 45-ish years and started young. And um, it's been stunning to me to really reflect, uh, including in the world of transformation and, you know, new age and human potential, too. And it's been stunning to me how many, many people, me included, focus on helping people have useful experiences with no – they systematically focus – on having certain kinds of experiences mm -hmm. or learning certain kinds of new thought or ideas or things like that. We focus there, certain body sensations or you know, ways of being with other people, but we don't tend to focus as a field, the self-help field we, and clini clinicians in general. We don't tend to focus on the how of learning. How do we turn those experiences, often hard-won experiences that people are having, how? Do we turn them into lasting change? And as soon as you track that, then you've acquired the superpower of superpowers, the one that grows the rest of them, the so superpower I, of learning. I, I know my audience behind me. They're going, they're going, Michael, you have got to ask this. He's been giving a lot of great advice, but how do we learn better or how do we learn how to learn better? Watch your mind learn. Uh, understand the change process in your own brain. Mm -hmm. uh, reflect on experiences you've had, such as the one you had uh, in um, on the lake there, what were you doing inside your own mind there, Michael, uh, to help the experience really come into you? You can step back and observe your own change process, your own growth process. You can also observe yourself not learning. I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of times where I look back and went, man, I didn't learn anything there. Uh, well, what was happening? Why didn't I learn anything there? You know, why didn't I grow? Why didn't that meditation retreat or therapy appointment or conversation with my friend make a difference? Why? Why do I need, you know, and so we, there too, you can observe yourself and through observing your own performance and your own mind, uh, realize, oh, this is how to be more skillful. In other words, people can get more skillful at uh, helping themselves transform more rapidly. Uh, there's a saying in Zen Buddhism that there are four kinds of practitioners, four kinds of Zen practitioners. They're like four kinds of horses, uh, and uh, they're, they're called. Basically, they're those for whom the path of practice is short and pleasurable. Then there are those for whom the path of awakening is short and painful. Then there are those for whom the path of awakening is long but pleasurable. And then there are those for whom the path of awakening, awakening is long and painful. So we can look back on our own experiences and uh, help ourselves have our own path be shorter and more enjoyable.
I, I call them the mantra that I have since my two my two NDEs, my two learnings with a two by four. I say kind, gentle, easy, good. That's how I want the experiences. Kind, yeah. gentle, easy, good. Yeah. And it, it sounds like a pitch. I don't mean it this way. Um, you know, I, I, my book, Hardwiring Happiness, is literally about this. It is literally about the how of self-help, the how of change. How do you do it? And then you can apply that how to anything you want to grow. Systematically, I use the framework of the three great needs that we and all animals have for safety, satisfaction, and connection. And therefore, we can, uh, through um, growth over time, we can move from fear in terms of safety, fear, anger, and helplessness, to calm strength and inner peace. In terms of satisfaction, we can move from frustration, disappointment, to uh, contentment, gratitude, gladness, and joy. In terms of connection, we can move from feelings of inadequacy or resentment to feelings of confidence and love uh, and self-compassion. So that's the opportunity for us. So really briefly, if, if, if you say, okay, tell us you know, how to get that uh, rocket takeoff, yep. rock star takeoff path, uh, one great way, honestly, is uh, flip through my book, Hardwiring Happiness. Thank you. And, and, and we'll go more to, to your books in a little bit here. In fact, you were talking before the show that you're working on a book of resilience. And I'm like, yeah. ah, resilience. We've got a storm coming up. People have internal storms. Resilience so, sounds so incredibly important. What can you tell us about what you're working on and what that means for our minds? Yeah, let me – actually, if I could just go back for a second. I thought the, the question you asked me was right on. And there was, okay, Rick, you've said a lot. How do we actually do it? And I want to say another word or two about it. Go for it. Learning and change is a natural process. Uh, we've, I've used some exotic terms. Bottom line, we know what it feels like when something lands in our heart mm. and there's a shift. We know what that feels like. Or we know when there's a sense of, okay, these are the three takeaways, or the, this is the one takeaway. This is what I want to budge around and be changed by. We know what that feels like. So... First and foremost, have confidence in yourself as a learner, broadly defined, as someone, as a grower, even though that sounds awkward. I like um, it. You know, have confidence. Second, watch your own mind. Observe your mind learning or not learning. Watch what gets in the way of getting a value out of a conversation with another person. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about extracting the durable value from the life we are already having. And key point here, the worse a person's life is, the more it sucks and the, the more they're let down by or not supported by their external conditions, mm -hmm. the more important it is for that person to look for those little opportunities in their day for an enjoyable, beneficial experience. You know, seeing a blade of grass working its way up through broken sidewalk, a moment of friendliness with somebody and a cup of coffee, uh, reassurance and relief when you finally get to the bathroom, uh, whatever it might be, a sense of your own grit and gritty determination and endurance and resilience and dogged tenacity, um, whatever it might be, the harder your life is, the more important it is to do what I'm talking about here. Look for those authentic opportunities to experience something good and then turn on the inner recorder to take it into yourself, period. And then the last thing I, I just want to say here about uh, being a learner is to um, watch your own self and see what helps you change. See what helps you change. I've been in the change business for 45 years, basically. And I, you can see that, wow, if I do this with my mind, mm -hmm. I actually shift. You can learn about learning, in other words, along the way. And uh, get interested in learning. Get interested in your own change process. Because that will get you, that will, like anything, whatever you're interested in, you tend to get good at it. Get interested in learning. Get interested in growth, the how of growth. And that will make you a better grower. All right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just, I'm, and I'm ready to bounce into resilience if you want to. So uh, last, last, last thing I have on this, and then I want to go into resilience, is, is, is there a limit to this? Is there, some people are going to be, well, well, I'll just leave it there. Is there a limit to this? So super good question. Um, we will not forget what happened, but we can gradually not be upset by it. 
And so in terms of that, and also certain uh, intense traumatic experiences, especially when people are young and very vulnerable, do tend to shape people. Mm. They're, um, they're kind of stuck with them. Also, roughly a third of the basis for who we are, our various attributes, are baked into our DNA. They're biologically grounded. So the field of opportunity is roughly two-thirds of who we are, what we are, mm-hmm. in, in its various nuances and you know, characteristics. But that still is two-thirds on average. Uh, and that's a lot of opportunity. So, um, in ter- so the limitation is what's genetic and so forth. But still, in the two-thirds of the pie that we can do something about, I'm not sure there is a limit. I think that um, I'm never going to bet against human potential in the human heart and the human spirit and the human soul. Never, ever, ever going to bet against it. And um, as someone who's done this for a long time, yet tendencies, habits tend to persist. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's important to not just witness the mind. We have to actively engage the mind. We have to work with it if you want to change ourselves for the better over time. And I use the word mind to also include the heart and emotion and love and so forth. Um, But you got to do the work. That said, the work that I'm describing here is sweet work because it's about marinating in what is beneficial. And what's beneficial almost always is enjoyable as well. Part of two, the, just one last thing, I, is there a limit? I think it's really helpful for people to feel inside themselves that they can flower and evolve and, and develop in authentic and credible ways, grounded in science and also the experience of millions and millions of people because evidence of mental change is evidence of neural change. If you're having a change of heart, if you're different in some meaningful way, something has had to change inside your body in terms of embodiment. So people can feel, can know, yes, if I just keep at it, if I maximize my opportunities each day, the past is the past, but it's on me to gain as much as I can from the experiences I'm having today. That's my responsibility, and it's my opportunity. And at the end of the day, the question I want to ask myself as I'm falling asleep is, did I grow as much as I could today? Did I learn? Did I release? Did I heal as much as I could today? That's the standard. And if you can say yes to that question, you can sleep peacefully and well and wake up cheerfully the next morning. Beautiful. There's a piece before we even get to resilience, if we're going to have time for resilience, but there's an important piece of self-love and self-compassion that we need here. Yeah. And to get on your own side. That's right. So you want to be on your own side in two ways. One, with a sense of the possibility, cheering yourself on, encouraging yourself, giving yourself courage through encouragement. Um, Also, getting on your own side is the part that says, all right, you have the life you have today. How can you learn and grow and heal and release as much as possible from it? So there's a muscular aspect to this as well. There's self-compassion. There's a sweetness there. There's a cherishing and a nurturance there. There's also a coaching, a guiding, a directing. I've gone out. I've done a lot of rock climbing, including with some guides sometimes. And a good guide is both encouraging. You can do it, Hanson. You can do it. But the guide is also saying, hey, go. Do it. Come on. Give it a try. I'll catch you. You're okay. Go. That's part of the truth, too, in getting on your own side. I, I love it. I did a, uh, um, as a kid, I did a uh, ropes course, kind of a yeah. climbing ropes course, froze up on it. At 19 years old, uh, was in college, did a ropes course, froze up on it. Holy scary. I, I yeah. got to do a ropes course with my nephews who are who are, are barely teens this past weekend, and and uh, you know this is many years since. How's it going to go for me? And I feel like I'm a very different person. Yeah. I was dancing on the ropes, and to me, it was such an amazing, healing, cathartic experience of how much the mind can change and rewire and isn't stuck in that old programming of fear. Fantastic. Fantastic sense of possibility. And knowing that, you can encourage yourself. The next time you know you meet a challenge like the ropes course when you were 19, you can be a wise friend to yourself right then and there. Yeah, that's great, Michael. Beautiful. Any, any uh, brief words that you'd want to share on how we start to bring more resilience into our minds? 
Oh, sure. Well, what do we mean by resilient? So resilient basically means that as you deal with life, uh, including opportunities, not just threats and challenges coming at you, you can ride the waves without drowning while still staying more or less on course. And if you get blown off or blown hard, and sometimes life hits us hard, bam, and we have to deal with something, but then eventually you can you know, right your ship and get back on your course again. That's the essence of what it means to be resilient. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of research on what makes people resilient. And the primary thing that makes people resilient is that ninth cell in the three by three grid. Resources in the mind. What you take with you when everything, what you got with you when everything falls apart. There are these ads these days, what's in your wallet? Uh, my version of that would be what's in your heart or what's in your inner backpack? What do you carry with you? Because that's all you have when the winds really start to blow. When the bottom falls out in your marriage, your family, your job, your country, the economy, what do you have inside yourself? And so my focus is about growing those resources, those inner strengths, like uh, determination, uh, uh, emotional balance, mindfulness, self-compassion, self-awareness, confidence, uh, a loving heart, uh, understanding other people, um, you know, courage. These are all the inner strengths we need. The book I'm writing actually has 12. I'll just name them quickly so people know what I'm talking about. So I'll just go through them. So 12 fundamental inner strengths, the 12 mm -hmm. strengths of resilient well-being, compassion, mindfulness, mm -hmm. learning, which is the superpower of superpowers, grit, gratitude, confidence, calm, motivation, intimacy, courage, aspiration, and generosity. Those are umbrella terms, they're headers, but you can see why, wow, people who have those inside themselves, mm -hmm. they are resilient. Beautiful. So I want to take my coaching hat off right now. I want to give it to you. And, and I, want, I don't want people leaving today without having a homework assignment yeah. that they can begin on. So maybe based on that, for, for cultivating our inner strengths, what one homework assignment would you give people today? Know what you are trying to grow. It may sound dumb seems obvious, most people don't know what they're trying to grow inside themselves. What specifically mm -hmm. are you trying to develop inside yourself? However you would put it, your own way of putting it, not worrying so much about this, being more patient with that, having more sense of self-worth, not being burdened or afflicted by what happened to me when I was a child, whatever it might be. It could be a subtle spiritual kind of awareness or recognition or insight or intimation of the divine that you carry with you wherever you go. Whatever it might be, know what you're trying to grow. And then look for opportunities to grow it every day. That would be a very specific suggestion I would make to people. Most people, frankly, are sort of drifting around or flopping around. They don't really know what they're trying to develop in themselves in a specific way. I would really suggest that. And then maybe they'll, if I could get a bonus thing that people can actually it. do. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, terms of the framework of the three needs, safety, satisfaction, connection, managed by avoiding harms, approaching rewards, and attaching to others. This is a fundamental model in psychology and biology, these fundamental needs. Um, if you think about it, love is the universal medicine for all three needs. Love helps us feel safer. It helps us feel satisfied. And obviously, it gives us a sense of connection. And love is love, whether it's flowing in or flowing out. So I would encourage people, if I could get a bonus suggestion here, to look for multiple opportunities a day in any way, shape, or form that's authentic mm -hmm. to feel cared about and to feel caring. To look for those opportunities, and when they come, take half a breath or a full breath or two or three, to feel it and stay with it. That will very much help people become more resilient over time. Woohoo! Jessica would want me to ask on that note, 
what advice would you give to parents to help their kids with this? To, to help the children themselves? Yeah. Uh, well, first, parents walk the talk. That's really important. I speak as a parent of a 29 and a 27 year old at this point. So walk your own talk. That's really important. But second, uh, with children, uh, this is a wonder. The, the taking in the good is kind of a header for what I'm talking about here. Kids love. I've worked with kids a ton. I've worked with parents a ton as well. And kids, uh, even teenagers, teenagers, you have to manage it a little differently. It's more like you tell them how to do it and then they do it on their own because you can't make them do anything. But up to around 13, 14, you can actually guide a child uh, mm -hmm. often just before bed. It's a very sweet time for a minute or two or three to just bring to mind, wow, what was really sweet today or good today? Or what, what did you like about today? Or what, what was successful about today? Or you just bring up something that's always true. Like, let's think about grandmother and how much she loves you or Bowser at the foot of the bed. <laughs> The little doggy, right? Or how cozy it feels to be together in our family in which we love each other. Or relating to something spiritual, God's love, Christ's love, whatever's meaningful for a person and the culture and value system in their family. You know, draw the child's attention. Help that experience start to happen, either because you just encourage it or maybe deliberately call it up with the child. Help that experience happen and then protect that experience for a minute or two or three so it really soaks into the child. That's an extremely powerful technique. And it happens right before bed. So it has bonus value because it stays with you over the course of uh, the night. And you can also, just finishing up, bit, much as I said of my first suggestion, know what you're trying to grow. With a child, it really helps also. What are the psychological resources, the inner strengths, the mental resources that would be useful for this child? Maybe this child's struggling to learn to read, mm -hmm. so it would be helpful for this child, let's say a second grader or a first grader, to um, ex have experiences of self-worth in other areas, like sports or friends or being good at video games, yeah. God help us, or Legos, anything, uh, or just being a really sweet person, a good heart. So that would be something you would focus on growing in that child. Or maybe it's a child who tends to be really anxious and has a hard time falling asleep in their bedroom down the hall. So you would focus on, let's say, building up a sense of being protected and calm. These are inner resources for anxiety. Or a sense uh, that you have allies with you, like your fairy godmother or guardian angel or this rope of energy and light that connects you to your mother's heart or your father's heart, uh, whatever you're trying to grow in that child. Or maybe it's a kid who needs more impulse control. They're a little aggressive and spirited and go, go, go and banging into some other people uh, at school. Well, that's a child maybe uh, experiences of calming and centering and realizing that you don't have to get all caught up in a lot of stuff on the playground. Maybe that's what you're trying to grow in the kid. So you could focus, you could use that time just before sleep to focus on these particular things that you're trying to grow. Uh, and then also teach kids a little bit about their brain. Kids are fascinated. I've done, I've had this little talk with a four-year-old girl one time. I drew a quick picture of a head. So that's your brain in there. The whole bottom line is you want to get the good stuff in there, right? She's like, yeah, I want to get the good stuff in my brain. So cool. Then her parents came back to me and said, man, she's still talking about getting the good stuff in her brain. Uh, teenagers are obsessed with their bodies. They're very self-referential. They're very interested in the brain. And uh, if we translate a lot of typical parent talk uh, into brain talk, suddenly it's like, oh, this is real. This is concrete. I better pay attention here. So, very, very cool. Suggesting. Yeah. Thank you. On that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Oh, yeah. Well, first, I think there are different versions of woohoo. There is the subtle, you look out and you go, wow. It's, it's more of a soft woohoo. Then there's the yeah, yeah, super duper. Like when the Golden State Warriors finally won the NBA championship this year, there was a big woohoo. Good things have happened to our kids. There's a big woohoo. So more generally. Um Wow, it's really interesting. Like I'm in a woohoo mode most of the time, to be really honest. And I'm tracking real issues. I got a health issue. I'm worried about our president. You know, I got a few other things. I'm, I'm paying attention to a variety of things. But um, I'm in the woohoo mode a lot. But that said, to the essence of your question, I love wilderness. I miss wilderness. 
for me, it's interesting. I use sky and space as yeah. wilderness because it is wilderness. Outer space gives me a sense of wilderness, even though I live in a suburban area on the edge of uh, open space. Wilderness gives me a wahoo. And the last thing that gives me a wahoo is the sense of people working together to make the world a better place. You can see so many signs of that, including people coming together around natural disasters, like Hurricane Harvey in Texas recently it's in other states, and now Hurricane Irma and others, and people organizing throughout the world. Um, I'll leave you with a funny quick little story. I was in Dubai, of all places, about a, a year ago for a World Happiness Conference. They have this big conference every year. I was a small fish in a big pond. Prime ministers walking around, security everywhere, uh, head of the UN, Elon Musk, all these muckety mucks out there. And in an Arab country setting, really interesting at a lot of levels, the thing that struck me more than anything was I felt I was bobbing up and down alongside 10,000 icebergs, that each one of those people, the German finance minister walking quickly with her briefcase and her bodyguards moving through the crowd, uh, these directors of NGOs of various kinds, community mental health centers in very traditional patriarchal uh, Arab countries, um, all kinds of things happening. It made me appreciate that each one of these people was the tip of an iceberg under which another 10,000 people were out of sight and bobbing up down around me in ways that you never learn about on the evening news were so many good people, including people like you doing the programs you're doing, who are helping to make the world a better place. And just knowing that is true and real. Wahoo! <laughs> me Woo <-hoo>! too. <laughs> So where can people go to find your books and you were mentioning beforehand your online programs and scholarships? Oh, super fast. Um, RickHanson.net, S-O-N, RickHanson, H-A-N-S-O-N.net. It's the basic place to start. Tons of freely offered materials. People can learn about, um, you know, my slide sets, videos, talks, all kinds of stuff. Very oriented toward practical results, including in very short snippets. I have some programs, very inexpensive. Uh, uh, I think they're less than a dollar each. Of 52 guided little audios, each one of which is less than two minutes long. I call it just one minute. So I have a lot of short stuff, too. And uh, in terms of the scholarship aspect, um, we offer online programs, and they're very well priced. We're really happy for people to pay for them for a year of transformation, including building up these 12 strengths. So I have an online experiential program that builds the 12 strengths of resilient happiness. Happy for people to do that. But if people have financial need, if they're older, if they've been in a disaster right now, like in Texas, uh, if they um, have, you know, if they're a student, we love giving out scholarships and we've given out, you know, many, 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 many of them. So financial issues should never stop anyone from doing one of my things. That Very said, cool. people should pay for it if they can. And the URL one more time. Oh, rickhanson.net, H-A-N-S-O-N. Perfect. And if you didn't catch rickhanson.net, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over to rickhanson.net. Do you have time for a just one minute meditation? Sure. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here mm -hmm. and then I'm going to leave you with a little quotation from the Buddha, if I may, at the very, very end. So there are many ways to meditate. What I'll suggest right now is come into a sense of being here in your own body. Focusing on the sensations in your body. Arriving, coming home. Aware of your breathing. A sense of resting, easing. And in this experience could be a sense of well-being. In particular, with a focus on opening the heart and warming the heart, maybe with a sense of breathing into and out of the heart.
There could be a sense of the experience you're having here coming into you, receiving into you a calming, a mindfulness, a centering, a well-being, taking it in, allowing it to become part of you. And finishing here with a quotation. Think not lightly of good, saying, it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone who's been listening or viewing here. I really wish you the best. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, Rick. This has been fantastic. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get hardwiring happiness, and begin hardwiring yourself today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you, Michael. It's a real pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. It is always so fantastic having you on the show. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>